Okay, our keynote this morning is Steve Peterson from NOAA. Uh, I've known Steve for about just the last year and a half since he's come to NOAA. We've interacted uh, between NASA and NOAA, and I've been impressed with his drive and uh, his project that he's taken on at NOAA that he's going to talk to you about. He has about 40 years' experience in engineering and management responsibilities, working at the Air Force, the NRO, and I know some people here know him from his NRO activities, and now at NOAA. Uh, as I look through his resume, what he has, what his responsibilities have in common, though, is a push for new technologies, a push for new ideas, but the other part is the push to get those transitioned into operations and what are efficient methods for doing that. All those are obviously important characteristics as we move into uh, the larger changes that we see now. So right now, he is at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He is the director of the Office of Satellite uh, Ground Services, OSGS, which is a new organization recently stood up within NOAA's NESDIS, the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service uh, within NOAA. Uh, so under that are all the ground systems and for the weather systems that we all rely on. Ground systems are, is a very large term. It's more than just satellite command and control. It's more than just one or two satellites, uh, and he's going to go into that in his, uh, in his talk. But his, new res his major responsibility now is to develop and migrate existing and future ground capabilities to an integrated service-based architecture that's uh, known as just wide. Prior to coming to, to NOAA, uh, he was chief technologist for the Advanced Systems and Technology Directorate at the NRO in Chantilly. Uh, providing technical oversight of the directorate uh, and its information technology portfolio and really help push and accelerate the infusion of some of the new, new technologies into their systems. Prior to the NRO, he retired, uh, he was with the Air Force. He retired in 2006 uh, with 29 years of commissioned service. He retired as a colonel. Uh, and he's had a whole list of activities there many of them with ties back to the Air Force satellite systems, uh, whether on flight hardware checkout, uh, flight systems, uh, ground you know, data analysis, those type areas. So he actually flew on the C-130 and other platforms as a flight test engineer, uh, developing equipment used for the aerial recovery of deorbited satellites. He was the director of engineering and support with Air Force Space Command 73rd Space Group. He organized and directed uh, in many of their technology development programs with Space Division, uh, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, Air Force Research Labs. He owns, the resume goes on. But again, all these had to do, he's very much uh, pushing the technology forward, pushing the actual use forward, and he understands the management and the the transition issues that go along with trying to get new systems uh, adopted. So, Steve, come on up. Thanks. Okay. Okay, good morning. So, as uh, Dan said, I'm currently at NESTIS, which is the spacefaring component of NOAA, and this morning I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit about our efforts currently and our plans to actually implement a lot of the things that have been talked about over the last couple of days and actually for the previous GSAWs going back a number of years. So let's start by, what I'm going to do is give you a little orientation on the satellite enterprise, which Dan already uh, helped me with a little bit, uh, talk to you about why we believe we need to change to actually start operating uh, our ground systems as an integrated enterprise rather than a set of standalone systems, which is traditionally how we purchase them. Talk a little bit about how we've, how we've changed our organization. We realized we absolutely needed to do that to be able to, to be successful. And then talk to you a little bit about the enterprise approach. We kind of think about this as changing the engines while you're still flying because we can't drop anything we're currently supporting as we change from the standalone approach to an integrated approach. And so talk about some of the strategies and the architecture work that we've done to date. So just to orient you, this is a pretty traditional picture 
of the satellite enterprise. Uh, the primary U.S. systems that we support are the legacy GOES and POS constellations. We also operate DMSP for the Air Force, and we partner uh, with our allies to process data from the uh, European Polar Satellite, as well as a couple other ones, the Jason Ocean Altimetry, uh, do some things with our Japanese friends. I uh, have a number of different international collaborations. Those all come into, virtually all of them come through the uh, Satellite Operations Facility, which is down at Suitland, just north of Andrews Air Force Base, if you're familiar with DC. Uh, so we have the, the, the uh, command and control, excuse me, the satellite uh, command and control stations. So we've got uh, Wallops and Fairbanks. Uh, and now we also use Falbard for SNPP. Uh, so, but the messages are a pretty traditional approach with the ground tying together all the, the disparate pieces. So I'm going to show you one piece of that just to kind of illustrate some of the challenges that we currently have today and, and lead into why we believe we need to change. What I've got is a chart on our ESPC, which is the system we currently use to process all the data that comes down. And the way the ESPC evolved was that over time, as new missions came in, each one brought their own stuff. So if you were to look at the ESPC today, you'd see that for each product that's produced, or each family, there's typically a separate set of servers, a separate software code base, and then each of those needs its own security controls, needs its own approval to operate. And so over the years, we've gotten to a situation where it's very complex, it's very challenging to make changes to it, and it's relatively inefficient to operate. Okay, so all, all bad things. So going forward, you know, we, we've looked hard at that and said, well, that's challenging, but we're also about to inherit two new highly capable ground segments. So that the GOES geosynchronous program uh, is about to go through a major block upgrade, uh, which is called GOES-R. It's actually a series of four geosynchronous satellites, and R is the first one. So the program is simply known as GOES-R. And then on the polar side, there's a joint polar satellite system, JPSS. So each of those was brought, excuse me, purchased as a standalone system. Each has a standalone ground segment. They are highly capable. They work very well to accomplish their intended purpose, but they weren't developed in any sort of an enterprise concept. So we have uh, the, the expense to maintain them is projected to be fairly high, require a significant number of people. And we're not able to get any of the benefits that we want to get from an enterprise. Uh, things like being able to share capability across missions, you know, the ability to bring in new missions, uh, even the ability to readily introduce new products. It's, uh, they're great capabilities, but they weren't brought forth in a fashion that, that really leverages where we want to be in the future. And a key driver to all of this is cost. Okay, Cap new capability is great, but Besides the new capability, you know, the leadership is really, really focused on cost. And the thinking is we've got these defined requirements that we're going to meet, and we've got to be able to find a way to bring those down, uh, especially with the advent of the new systems. And so we have a vision, which I'll go into detail in, in, in a little bit more in a moment, about this future ground enterprise. And basically, that's a much more flexible, agile enterprise, has a concept of operation that allows us to be a lot more responsive in the way we make changes and enhancements to things. Uh, it helps us uh, to use the infrastructure much more effectively, you know, sharing it across multiple missions when it's not, not in use by one, you know, share it with the other, be more efficient in terms of how we do sparing and logistics. Uh, and, and undercutting all that or underlying all that is the adoption of uh, a set of well-defined business processes internally so that when we do make upgrades or changes, we're able to do that in a fashion that um, is, is very scalable and extensible. And so what that really translates to in the enterprise, there's two pieces to this, right? There's the mission success piece, piece that we really care about as operators, and then there's the cost effectiveness piece uh, that our leaders are really, really focused on as we move forward. And some, in some cases, changing the way we behave impacts both of them positively at the same time. So things like uh, eliminating redundant acquisition of common functionality. Okay, if you remember that picture I showed on the ESPC, all those different missions, each one performs the same sorts of functions, whether it's orbital dynamics calculations, data ingest, memory management. There's a whole variety of functions that are predictable, 
that our, that our sys ground systems perform that are replicated each time a new one's brought in. What we want to do is get to the point where we have a set of services that do those functions once. And then we maintain one set of services, one set of code, rather than multiple similar sets of code, which should cost us quite a bit less than in the long run. Uh, typically, the costing for software maintenance, the, the experts will tell you that it's linear with the lines of code to a rough degree. So if you can cut the amount of software you're maintaining by a third or a half, you should see very significant savings. And when you extrapolate that out across a 20-year life cycle, if you save 5 or $10 million a year, 10 times 20 is $200 million, which is a lot of money. And so we're looking hard at how can we move to a much more um, cost-effective approach and uh, common software and hardware environment helps us deploy new capability. And I mentioned some of the business process changes that we're trying to get to. So from within the enterprise, that's kind of the vision of why we really want to change. Okay? From a little bit higher, the leadership perspective says that, that we absolutely need to change, but you've got to do that in a fashion that doesn't drop anything at all. Okay? So we have, to, we have to sustain that current capacity. And, and in the organization I'm going to talk about in the next chart, that's one of our main charters is to do the sustainment of all the existing ground systems across Nestus. Then simultaneously help these two new programs deliver their ground segment. Uh, in the case of Gozar, they're start, they've gone into testing and the launch is in about a year. In the case of JPSS, they have the last year of software development still ongoing during FY15, so we're, we're a couple years from launch. We have to help them, and then after those transition to ops and sustainment, then we're going to really fully implement uh, this GEARS construct. And, and the way this is going to work is my organization currently is responsible for sustainment of all the legacy ground systems. So we don't operate them, but we do make upgrades to them, add new capability, do tech refresh cycles, those kinds of things. What will happen is a period after launch, in each of these new satellite constellations, begin, we'll get responsibility for the ground system, and we have to carry that forward. We'll also have the authority to make changes to it to bring it into compliance with this, this enterprise construct. So it's a really exciting time because we have a number of different, very different activities that kind of need to proceed in parallel, and then the goal is to bring them all, all together a bit downstream. So if you're thinking about, well, gee, how would you actually get at this, the good news is there's no technology limitation to it as best as we're aware. There's no unobtainium, right? There's nothing we have to invent. Everything that we're going to use has been used in industry and in government multiple times before. You have to do the system engineering right, but there's nothing there that's undoable. So that's the good news. The other news is it's going to require a lot of change on the human level. And I've got a list here for you, just some of the things we're looking at. You know, our existing workforce, uh, operates under processes that simply aren't going to be scalable to the future. So because we have all these different systems that came in over time, we've got a blizzard of small contracts. We do things like hands-on software maintenance, right? We even have government civil servants in some cases that have learned those systems that have been working with those systems for many years that, that understand the subroutines and the structure well enough to actually get in there and make modifications and changes. And that's part of the culture of the way we've grown up. Well, we expect when we inherit these two new systems that we're going to have to change. They're going to be way too complex to be able to do that. The people that do that m may very possibly find themselves in positions where they're supervising the folks that do it or they're leading teams that do it rather than being able to, to hands-on do it themselves. So a lot of change there. Uh, and so we're, we're thinking hard about, okay, how do we get the people trained and how do we show folks the value of moving to, to, to this different perspective, and, and how do we do that without dropping anything that's currently going on? So our leaders said, we're going to start all this by uh, standing up a new organization. It's my organization, the one that I, I was hired to, to organize and lead. And basically, our vision is to be the organization that does all the ground development with a view towards this true future integrated enterprise, looking hard at ways to save cost and add capability in a fashion that the organization can digest as we move to that new vision. So we really have three different missions, and I'm going to go through a few charts on each of these just to give you a feel for some of the challenges we have and some of our 
the approaches that we've adopted to get there. So the missions are all key, but they're notionally different from each other. So the first one is to sustain everything that's currently flying. So keep doing the upgrades, keep handling the security, uh, implementing new security requirements as they come along. The second is to provide a staff to help finish those two new ground segments that I mentioned, the GOZAR and JPSS. So we're matrixing people back to those programs to help finish the work. And then the third is to actually do the enterprise thinking and do the enterprise building. So make the new investments that allow us to move from standalone, highly capable, to service-oriented, uh, potentially, at least we anticipate, significantly less expensive and, and more agile operate. And I've got a, a ConOps chart a little ways in it that will show you, illustrate for you, some of the things we're really trying to, to achieve. So the first mission I mentioned is sustain the current capability, and that really boils down to taking care of the GOES and POS and the antennas uh, that support them. So we're focused really hard on doing the things, the modernization the, that we absolutely have to do, but we're trying to bring in a degree of enterprise thinking whenever we do that. So things like we're currently upgrading our security controls. And so looking at, well, how can we do those in a system-to-systems -systems approach rather than a standalone instantiation, which is the way we would have done it in the past. We do have three early enterprise elements that are under development, and in some cases they were started well, well before there was thought given of, of creating my new office, and those are going to help lead us as pathfinders. Uh, they don't have the full capability we're going to need for the long term, but they're a start, and they're helping us think about what the implications are and what provisions we're going to have to make when we do this on a larger scale. And so those, are the, those three pieces are class, NDE, and PDA. And I'm going to give you a, a chart on each of those to show you uh, the kinds of capability uh, that they bring forth. Now we're also, as part of the organizational um, um, execution as we go forward, we're also bringing the other development activities into my group. So one of the thoughts was that you really want to exercise configuration control. And you also want to apply the software development life cycle processes, the system engineering, across everything we do. So we have a pretty strong handle on how that needs to be done. It's already being done in these three new systems that I'm going to talk about a little bit. But it hasn't been done consistently across the entire organization. And so we're bringing in the pieces of development that are elsewhere as we staff up and have the people to, to take them on to start to be consistent and get people thinking about behaving in a little different fashion than we have. And then the last bullet uh, undercuts or underlies everything we do, and that's the cost avoidance, right? So uh, you heard the general speak on Tuesday about the cost of, of maintaining GPS. I think he said it was roughly 75 million-ish and, and well over 100 million for the MILSATCOM series of systems. Uh, the new ones we're getting are a bit less than that, but not much less. And so you look at that, that growth over our current budget. You know, if you look in the, uh, in the Congression, it's all unclassified in our case. So you can look at the Congressional budgeting documents. You'll see in our ops and maintenance side, it's about $90 million a year or so right now. So with the addition of these two new systems, that's going to more than double what we're currently spending. And so we're looking very, very hard to see how we can take the concepts that we've been talk talking about here at GSAW and actually apply them to, to gain these efficiencies. Okay, so ESPDS is basically our modernization of that Environmental Satellite Processing Center, the ESPC that I showed you right at the, the very beginning, the center that has all the, all the different processes um, in, in a standalone, non-integrated fashion. And what we've done with this is we're, we're the, the long-term vision is that it will be able to interface to everything else and grow. The shorter-term vision is that it has two components to it that are both on track to support uh, the upcoming new launches. And those are our PDA, our product distribution function, and NDE, which produces products from the, the basic level one JPSS data uh, and does both those in a, in a much more enterprise-like fashion. We're going to have an instantiation of this at our primary ops center. Uh, in Suitland. We're also building a consolidated backup center in Fairmount, West Virginia, and that has backup for JPSS processing and it has backup for Gozar and Downlink as well as the processing. Uh, and we're going to have uh, an, an ESPDS uh, instance there as, as well. 
So the ESPDS is built upon a SOA, and this is one of those early, early enterprise elements where we knew that we wanted to, to start developing systems in a different fashion. It has the, the typical SOA benefits, right? Extensibility, uh, reusability, uh, modularity, all, all things we've talked about. This actually instantiates those, and, and we've learned a lot as we've done this in terms of how flexible it can be, how many standards you have to have, uh, and so forth. A key part of that is PDA, Product Distribution and Access. And basically, the, the, the purpose of PDA is to help us be much more efficient, both in terms of people and equipment and comms bandwidth. So if you remember the, the first chart I showed you with the ESPC, with all those different missions, well, over the years, each mission cultivated its customer set, and each mission put in separate comm lines to what were typically the same types of destinations. And so our CIO organization took a good hard look at that and said, you know, if we were able to have just one central distribution system, we could buy much larger pipes to each of those places, much more economical than buying a whole lot of small pipes. And in doing, we could also structure a system where people are able to manage their own subscriptions. So instead of a 24 by 7 help desk that requires a couple of people to field inquiries from the folks in the field, they either aren't getting what they need or they want to change their requirements. Now we're going to have a system where as a user, you'll be, you'll be put in a user class that has an allocation of services, and then you decide what you want, and you decide when you want to change it, and we don't have to pay that staff to service those needs. So it's more flexible, it's more responsive, and it's less expensive. So PDA is a key part of that. Uh, another piece of it is class. Class is our new archive system. Uh, I guess I probably knew might not be a, an absolutely accurate word. It's been an, in development for a number of years. Originally, it was conceived to support the archiving of GOES data and JPSS data. So those data sets have the, have the, um, the characteristics of being very large but also very predictable. So once you get the format set, you know, the data is going to flow like that for as long as the systems are up there. We are looking now at how we grow class so that it can handle much smaller data sets that have much different, many different structures. So in NOAA, we have a number of different organizations that collect data, uh, and there is a government mandate to preserve a gold copy of those data on into the future, which is what class is, what class is originally designed for. And so we're doing things like developing a machine-to-machine -machine capability where you can automate the ingest of those data sets and also the creation of metadata, which is really, really key uh, to being able to use it. And this also kind of highlights one of our objectives uh, within Nestus, and that's to make the data that we collect as usable as it can possibly be to everybody. So add as much value to it as we can and make it available to other people to add value as well. And so we're architecting this in a way that's going to make the metadata searchable, discoverable, and then the data itself uh, readily retrievable. And here's, a, here's just kind of a, a summary chart to that that talks a little bit more about uh, some of the benefits that we're going to get from class. I think I've probably touched on most of these. It is going to consolidate a number of standalone legacy archival systems as we get the machine-to-machine -machine piece going. Uh, I think I pretty much covered that. So mission, so I just finished now talking about mission one, which is sustain all the things that are currently in operation, sustain the ground systems that are that are allowing operators to command and control the satellites. The second mission is to help finish those two new ground segments. So when my organization was stood up a couple months ago, I inherited all the NOAA civilians that were working on ground segment development in GOZAR and JPSS. And I immediately matrixed them back to those programs so that they could finish the work that they were doing helping to develop those ground segments. Now, as we do this, we're looking hard at giving them every opportunity we can to learn the skills they'll need to be the sustainers. Because when the, once those spacecraft launch and the systems get turned over for ops and for sustainment, that's the team that's going to be most knowledgeable about those systems. So in this case, they're still doing kind of the same work they were doing originally, but with a, a significantly stronger focus now, I think I'm being prepared for sustainment. And also, they're helping my team writ large get more knowledgeable about those systems and identify early opportunities to start bending them a little bit in the future toward an enterprise construct 
where we have the benefit of some of the things I'll show you in the, in the ConOps in a moment. So it's a really exciting time, uh, and we're looking really hard at how we can take advantage of those tech refresh opportunities, which aren't too far out in, in both cases. So the third mission uh, is, is the one that really focuses on getting us to an integrated enterprise, right? So we're going to keep things currently operating going. We're going to finish the development of the two new systems that are almost delivered. But at the same time, we're looking hard at how are we actually going to do this integrated enterprise? What are the trades? Where does it make sense to make those investments early? And then how do we need to structure the team to be able to get those things done? So this past year, we had a small architecture team that developed a concept of operation as well as some level zero and level one requirements, draft requirements. This year, we've reformulated that activity a little more. We have a much, uh, a much uh, stronger team. We've got more people assigned to it, and we're very thoughtful about uh, where we're able to pull those people from. Uh, they're focusing hard on fleshing out the architecture artifacts and then doing the gap analysis and pro providing a transition roadmap. That roadmap is a joint activity between the architects and my system engineering team that's looking at the actual opportunities and doing the trades, traditional system engineering, but with an enterprise focus now rather than a standalone focus. Uh, and I think that pretty much, and, and then subsequently, we're gonna, we're gonna actually make investments and, and develop services and, and, and migrate to that. So here's the CONOP. This, this document's been really key to our whole endeavor uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it describes the capabilities that we want to bring forth so that people can understand why we really want to make these investments. But I think the most critical part of it by far is the use cases. So we're using this as a vision document and also something to get folks to rally around to help us move forward with these changes. And if you're on the receiving end of this, you know, you really want to know, how is this going to impact me? How is it going to make a difference? Why should I go through the pain that's going to be necessary to uh, make some of these changes? And so we've got about a dozen different use cases that capture pretty much everything we do in the enterprise. If you were to look across a year or two of, of behaviors, everything from day in the, a typical day in the life where maybe you've got to switch a couple of contacts or you've got to, you've got to adjust your ops schedule based on some equipment failures, all the way to uh, integrating a new mission, integrating an, an, an external data product, uh, transitioning a research satellite into ops. We've done that a couple times in the past. Uh, creating a new data product, uh, developing new algorithms is a very common thing we do today, and, and it's somewhat of a challenge because each system is different. Uh, calibration and validation, and even adding new common capabilities. So there's something in there that touches just about everybody that works with the enterprise, and we're using that as a way to illustrate what the benefits are gonna be. Just to give you kind of some context, I put together, this is my only metrics chart, just to give you kind of a feel for what we're taking on. In the upper left, you'll see in the, in the light blue, um, the description of what we've got in the, in the current enterprise, about 12 million lines of code, few hundred servers, uh, and I use lines of code and servers just as a couple of metrics to kind of help you sort of grasp what we're trying to do. In the upper right in the yellow, you've got the three new enterprise elements, the early enterprise elements, right? They're bringing a couple million more lines of code, a few hundred more servers. And then down on the bottom, in the, in the, in the, uh, the red and the purple, those are the two new systems that we're about to inherit, right? Gozar is going to launch in about a year, JPSS a year after that. And you can see in the case of Gozar, you know, they've got uh, not a tremendous amount more code, still almost a couple million lines of code, but, you know, well, um, roughly a thousand servers, the JPSS. Again, we've got hundreds of servers, six million lines of code in that case. So the message is we're, we're adding another 50% LOC to what we already have, and, and actually more than that operationally because of the 12 million, a lot of that is legacy stuff that, that doesn't play a current role in the enterprise. We're adding an awful lot of hardware. So the question is, okay, how do we bring this together and really convert it into an enterprise? So in terms of, of the enterprise approach, uh, the common service, we're going to move to a, a services-oriented construct. And there's really two kinds of services. There's the common services that we talk about a lot, available in any application. They're in the service registry. Uh, those, they exist based on a service level agreement 
that we will reestablish that will maintain the performance of those to a specific level. So when a new satellite program comes, uh, it's able to, to, to predict the kind of support it'll get. We'll maintain those as part of the enterprise. And then there's private services. So if you come in and you do something really unique that other folks don't really need access to, you don't have to expose those services as common services to everyone. You can choose to maintain them yourself, but you're still going to do it in a modular services-based way so that you can take advantage of the common services that you need and we don't have to replicate the whole thing. So during 14, we did take an initial look at, at uh, allocating services to different service suites. And I have some of those summarized here. Uh, there's a couple levels of, of, of deeper breakout from that. Nothing here that would, that would be unusual if you've looked at other satellite systems. Virtually all of them perform many of the same functions. And so uh, pretty straightforward. As we evolve, we're looking hard at how we're going to make investments, but the one thing that's clear is that we're not going to try to make a big leap. We're going to take this piece by piece, making investments where we can show a substantive benefit, and the investments are going to be primarily focused on those two big new pieces, plus whatever the legacy is going to be around long enough to make it worth spending money on it. And so what we'll wind up with in the end will be a bit different than what you'd get if you started with a clean sheet of paper. Okay, we don't have that luxury. What we've got is two highly cool, brand new, standalone segments coupled with lots of legacy stuff. And so we're going to look hard at how can we create those services and start to move to them so that over time we get to the service-oriented approach, just like you saw yesterday in the ESA pitch where they had 30-some different, different capabilities. Uh, if you talk to the teams that developed that, you'll discover that they did it by piggybacking on new missions. Each time there was a new mission, they'd use it to develop one or two of those so that over time they evolved. It wasn't, wasn't a big bang monolithic approach and it wasn't a go back and retrofit everything you got. So we're looking for the opportunities where we can show a substantive benefit uh, and change. And so this, uh, this is almost my last chart and I wanted to use it to, to highlight the importance of addressing cost. We're looking at every possible source of cost and asking ourselves, how can we make progress bringing those down? So in the area, in operations, labor, you know, clearly automating common functions, adopting a common user interface, so training is much easier, and you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to have perhaps as many different crews. Uh, automation of common tools, so things like a configuration management tool, risk management tool. We can get the same thing in use across the programs. People only have to be trained on it once. It's also only one set of licenses that we have to buy. In terms of facilities, we currently have very traditional uh, computer rooms like you've seen pretty much all over, over the last few decades. We're looking at moving to an IT trailer concept. Okay, industry's done this for about two decades now, and there are actually small towns up in the northwest where the power is really cheap, where there are buildings that consist pretty much of nothing but IT trailers that uh, the big IT giants have have used for many years to, to cut their costs and be competitive. We're looking at bringing some of that into to our enterprise. Uh, in terms of, of services, we've already started to move toward NOAA's N-Wave network, which is a much less expensive uh, alternative to AT&T and, and, and folks like that. In the maintenance area, we're looking at uh, developing a technical reference model. We actually have a draft, and the TRM lists the approved hardware that you can have in the enterprise. So going forward, if we can narrow the different types of hardware we have to support, we ought to be able to get a, get a better deal buying them because we're going to buy more of them. And it ought to be easier to carry the maintenance because there are fewer different ones to, to have to be uh, uh, knowledgeable of. In terms of software, uh, we're looking hard, as, as I said, at reducing those lines of code through common services because we think that's where you'll make significant gains on the overall cost of the operation. We're also doing some experimenting in our lab, looking at how we can eliminate some of the more expensive COTS products. So if I can take a PostgreSQL open source database and insert it and replace an Oracle license database, potentially I could save an awful lot of money over the life cycle of that system. So we're looking hard to see just how feasible is it to really do that. Uh, and then in the sustainment area, uh, looking at uh, 
uh, potentially going to some commodity equipment rather than typically the high-end uh, things that we get, and also a common algorithm framework. So right now there are products that both our geosatellites and our polar satellites produce, and we have different sets of code to, to produce the same product. And so we have a team looking at how we can kind of standardize that so there's only one code base to maintain, and you can feed it with data from whichever satellites are available to, to make the observations. So in summary then, I've talked to you about how we're, how we're seeking to execute these three separate but interrelated missions, having to, to uh, keep everything sustained that we're currently doing, bring forward those early enterprise elements, uh, talk a little bit about our enterprise, which we call GEARS, our enterprise solution, which is the transformation of all that. And, and hopefully, if, if nothing else, we remember that, that cost avoidance is really, really critical objective that, that really drives uh, everything that we're doing. The, the cap new capability part is great, but ultimately the leaders are most focused on seeing us work to existing requirements and really bring down that cost. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take a question or two. Thanks. I, I'd like to really thank you. you. You kind of encapsulated many of the themes that we've been hearing for years, and I, I wish you the very best of luck in implementing them at NOAA. It's just, just amazing and great to hear. Um, I did have one question about one thing you mentioned that I thought was kind of unusual, the idea of getting uh, developers to become the maintainers, and I'm wondering how that concept is going over with the developers. Uh, in terms of? Well, typically, my typical developer wants to keep developing and not sustaining. Okay. Uh, right, so let me talk to that a little bit. And I may not have been completely clear. So are you talking about the change from the way we do it with legacy to, to, to the future? Um, well, and I was thinking about the people because... Um, just my experience has been that developers like to keep developing. They don't like to maintain. They want to develop it and move on. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Right. So I should probably clarify. Within NOAA, we have maybe a little different delineation between those than some of the other organizations do. So we treat maintenance as part of ops for true maintenance, where you're fixing problems that you discover as you're, as you're operating, as part of an ops responsibility. We use sustainment to denote uh, tech refresh plus the development of new capability. So the people that are doing sustainment are still, in, are still doing new capability, but you're right, it's in a different context. It's for a field of system rather than creating something completely new. That's right. Yep. Thank you. Sure. So in this, with this increased collaboration with uh, DOD and, and NASA, who I think are fairly, they're larger than you. Do, are you able to, to maintain control and independence of this architecture, or can they just come in and sort of bully you and say, hey, this is not going to work because our next four or five satellites that you're getting need to do X, Y, Z that you hadn't considered or thought about? So that's a great question. Uh, we're actually working that challenge on a number of different levels simultaneously. Uh, I think on a on a personal level, on an organizational level, we've got great support with, with the NASA leadership uh, as, as, as well as the NOAA leadership um, and absolutely determined to make this work. On a technical level, NOAA, uh, which, which pays the cost of, which pays NASA to develop NOAA satellites, NOAA has a vision that going to the enterprise is going to help all of us. And the way we're going to, one of the big changes uh, is that when the enterprise is mature, so however far down the road you believe that's going to happen, you'll have a ground enterprise with defined interfaces. Each interface will have a service level agreement attached to it. And so instead of designing a satellite to do a mission, a traditional systems engineering, and then strapping out whatever ground you need to get it to work, it's going to be the polar opposite of that. 
you're going to have the ground defined, the interfaces will be defined, and if you don't want to use those interfaces, you're going to have to make an awfully good case that they simply are unacceptable for your mission. And then, if you do have some unique elements, you'll be asked to cost those, and then the funds will be given to the enterprise to instantiate that new capability that you need in the enterprise, in an enterprise fashion, so that when you're not using it, the other people that would like to use it as part of the enterprise will have access to it. So that's a fundamentally different way than the way we operate today. You know, I think I had the bumper sticker on a couple of charts. I don't think I called it out. But, you know, the idea is to never buy another ground system. We don't ever want to have to do that again. So there, it does have a lot of change embedded in it, but everybody recognizes that we can't afford to spend another billion dollars on another new ground system. So I think, I think we've got really good agreement to work ahead. Steve, uh, great uh, presentation, and you're headed, based upon everything that we've heard here in GSAW for many, many years, you, uh, you're headed in the right direction. Um, go, as you transition to gears, uh, it seems to me that there is a significant cultural change that people are going to have to go through uh, as you transition from legacy because uh, there's legacy drag always, right? That right. people want to do things the way they've always done right. them. And Gears is going to be a different model. So have, what, what things have you or, or what, what is in the Gears plan to facilitate that cultural transition that which will have to take place? So, that, so that's a great question. And I, I'll say right up front, the cultural aspect of this is by far the most challenging part. It's the one that we think about the most. Uh, this is really about change. How do you bring about change, and, and how, do you, how do you successfully uh, cause it to endure long after the people that conceived it are gone? So we're doing a number of things, uh, which I think in some will give us a really excellent opportunity to be successful. There are, so things like uh, using the CONOP to illustrate to people that there are benefits for them, that it's not just a negative in you know, whatever ways they're most familiar with. Uh, taking it in small pieces mm -hmm. so there isn't this dramatic change. It's a piecewise change over time where we have an opportunity to learn. And some of the things we're going to try probably aren't going to be completely successful. So kind of like agile programming, right? Mm -hmm. If you take it in pieces, you can learn from, from what you've discovered right. and then use that to revector yourself. So it's taking it in pieces. It's being very sensitive to the human dimension. You know, things like automation, what I want to be able to do is to give the people that are currently in roles the opportunity to go to maybe a more engaging role or more something that they would define in their own mind as a more value-added role, mm -hmm. something that, that gives them at least as much gratification as what they're currently doing. So that there's a lot of positives to this if we think about some of the challenges to it and plan for them as we go through. If I could ask one quick follow-up. Sure. Uh, at the NRO, they talked about identifying a ruthless ruler in the transition. Yes. Are you that ruthless ruler? I'm not ruthless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do have control of all the ground money, though, going forward. <laughs> so, sir, my, my question, I think, is along the lines of the ruthless ruler. You had a, a comment or a bullet in a previous slide just prior to this, and maybe I'm reacting to the absolute nature of that bullet, eliminate COTS. So it seems to me you're talking about having to train government civil servants and uh, other contractors to, to maintain your software. I'm wondering why are you saying, making such a statement to eliminate COTS when you can get a lot of advantage and cost savings in letting the COTS vendor do the tech refresh, do the updates, deliver you. Yeah, there's a licensing cost, but there's a reason, you know, why there's right. that licensing cost right. that saves you money potentially. I'm just curious about your, sure. your thoughts. Sure. So that, Thank that's, you. a, that's, a, that's a great question. Let me give you a uh, an experience-based answer. Uh, the goal here is not to eliminate the, the maintenance piece of that. Whether it's open source or COTS, we're going to have to pay to maintain it anyhow. The goal is to eliminate the license cost. And that really springs from my experience in, in a prior life in another organization where we had made kind of a Faustian deal with a very well-known vendor who said, you know, we'll, we'll write you a very reasonable license. Any of your primes can use it. You can develop it as much as you want. And so if we waited a few years of that, and everybody got that embedded in their system. And then, you know, as you might predict, well, they came in one day and said, well, this year's license cost is going to go up double digits. And then the next year, it was double digits. Third year, the director of this agency got involved 
and they said, it's going to go up double digits, and by the way, we're going to count people differently, right? So instead of 100 people in this company of 1,000 using the product and, and, and us being charged for that, you know, now we're thinking that maybe the other 900 might be sneaking in under cover of darkness and using it, so your license fee is going to go up by an order of magnitude. And so as we got into that kind of discussion, we realized that there's very little value to putting yourself in a position where you can be so dependent on any individual vendor that basically they can charge what they wish. And so this, you know, the move to open source has a blizzard of benefits. Uh, besides just saving the license fees, it's generally believed, I believe, in the software industry that open source products are significantly more secure because everybody can put their eyes on the source code and everybody can identify vulnerabilities rather than being hidden behind a, uh, a large corporate shield. So I think there's an awful lot of positives to come from that. DOD has an open source office that actually advocates uh, the use of that, and we're uh, looking forward to syncing up with them and learning what we can from them. Anything else? Do we have any more time? Yeah. Go. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.